Uh, David was for 32 years a member of the British Army Intelligence Corps. Uh, he retired early from the Army to become the Chief Security Officer at BAT Industries. Under David's 14-year stewardship, BAT became recognized through independent research as the international benchmark company for corporate security. For the next 45 minutes, he's going to share some thoughts with us in a, a talk that's, uh, I think, aptly, uh, aptly laid out given the conversations we've just had. Ladies and gentlemen, David Burrell. Okay, can I just check? The, the high tech in here confuses me sometimes. Everybody can hear me clearly? Okay, that's great. I will have to apologize that occasionally I'll have to turn around and look at the slide because I haven't got one in front of me here. Um, but we're going to look at what's been a very vexing subject within the area of corporate security for years is just where does it stand? Where is its authority? Why are there not chief security officers, and I'm not talking about security firms now, I'm not talking about security firms, why are there not chief security officers actually sitting at XCOM level, board level, etc. But before I go into that, what I'd like to do is just ask for a show of hands. Can I have a show of hands of those who consider themselves part of the security industry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I have a show of hands of those who can... Uh, you've put your hand up. Right, okay, See, and you've, you are as well. So most of you are part of the security industry. How many of you do not work for security providers of any form of service? Okay, very interesting. Who do you work for? Sorry? Yeah, yeah I, I, the reason I ask this question is that it, it's a starting point for this. Lots of people who might be a security manager in Nestle, VAT, GE, or whatever, if I ask that question, they'll think they're part of the security industry. There's the beginning of a problem. They're not part of the security industry. They may be security professionals, but they're not part of the security industry. They're part of whatever company they happen to belong in, and that is their primary requirement in terms of industry loyalty. So there is an issue there. The Next thing that I want to talk about is just get a feel for, let's go on here, right, does it matter, does it matter if the chief security officer of a company, or it might be the regional security manager in a region, their top team, it might be the security manager in a country, their top team, does it matter if they don't have a seat at the table? That's the question mark. If the instant response is it doesn't matter at all, you've got problems. <laughs> you've got big problems because you don't understand the way in which companies function to make change, to make decisive decisions, strategic decisions, which in fact impact on every aspect of the delivery of security right the way down to the purchase of maybe an access uh, capability in a new head office somewhere. So it's a problem. Does it matter how far away the head of security is from that table? So is he reporting direct to somebody at that table? Which I have to tell you is probably the case for the majority of chief security officers in multinational companies. But not all of them. A lot of them are another step away, and another lot are three steps away. The further they are away, the less is their ability to impact and influence at the highest level. And usually that means that their message, if they give one, is distorted as it goes through several routes. I'm sure you all know if you get a message saying something's happened, if that's come from somebody who wasn't actually there, what you're, not, what you're getting is something which isn't necessarily an accurate reflection of what really did happen and is almost certainly not a reflection of something that actually did happen. It's been distorted somehow through the passage. So there's fundamentally a problem there. Going to an anecdote, I remember, gosh, this is about 15, 20 years ago, a chief security officer of a multinational, he was American, who'd had status in one of their government services just 
one below ambassadorial level. And he got a top job in a multinational. And I remember talking to him about our concepts of philosophy, and he was too removed from his XCOM, C-suite, whatever you care to call it. And I said to him, does that matter? He said, not at all, David. He said, I'm comfortable. <laughs> I'm topping up my pension. <laughs> and I don't want any waves. Those who don't want any waves in their lives, you don't want a seat at the table. <laughs> okay, but if you want to influence and create change, then you do want a seat at the table. Point about the, where I, my perspective comes from. All my commercial life has been spent working at the top end, the strategic side, the leadership side of multinational companies. I do not claim, nor do I offer any services or advice to small businesses and very few medium businesses. Even now, most of my time is spent conducting what you might call McKinsey-type reviews, but entirely focused on intelligence and security in multinationals. That's the area that I work. So I'm taking a high-end perspective and looking down in respect of its impact, top down on the right. And it's primarily a focus on people, not a focus on technical capabilities or anything like that. It's a focus on people. And people are critical in this. Now, that is not to say that pressure from below going up cannot help. It can. But I'm just being honest to you about where my perception is, okay? And that's where it is. You'll notice I'm not reading out the slides to you. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt that you can read, okay? And I will pick out certain things to make comment on. So please do read through to them. But red flags, I'm sure everybody knows what red flags are. They came from the insurance industry originally, which looked at situations, and if they were red flags, it meant that something could be wrong. Not necessarily is wrong, but could be wrong. And the more red flags that one can find in any organization, the more likely it is that something is seriously wrong. Okay? When I do reviews of companies, I look for red flags as I go through. These are examples of some of the red flags. The point about outset engagement, clearly, if you're not in there when the decisions are made, if you're not in there when a project team is chosen, and when its criteria is set up, your impact, if it is going to come at all, is going to come late. And even if we just talked on the technical side, you know what happens when you do things late. It costs a lot more money, and sometimes it's irretrievable. So that is a major thing there, okay? And very often I find that the security department, the chief security officer, has no impact at all on the formal business security, on the formal business strategy plan or the annual business plan. More often than not, does not even feature. You're getting an idea here of impact or lack of impact. Unconvincing measurements and metrics there's almost a fear of having to measure in a really, really meaningful way the achievements that are being claimed. You know what it's like even when your personal uh, achievements are set, KPIs, and they've got to be, they? they've got to be challenging and stretching, etc., etc. And so often, people are actually looking for something that isn't quite so challenging, isn't quite so stretching, so that you feel comfortable. <laughs> that it's going to be achieved. That stands out very markedly in many security departments. Not the good aspect I've described, the bad aspect. Okay? That in itself is a problem. The chief security officer, does he attend senior company leadership meetings? All the companies I'm talking about will hold at least once or twice a year an event when they bring in all the senior leadership. Probably, if you're thinking in terms of vice presidents, senior vice presidents, it's all the vice, senior vice presidents, maybe a few vice presidents. But again, too often, I find that in the case of security departments, they don't feature. They're kept out. Somehow, they're considered to be different. 
And the business of the business function, it relates into my show of hands earlier on. You know, do you think of yourself as business people, businessmen? Again, not talking to the service providers. I know that's how you live, <laughs> okay? But there we are. So, all these red flags do amount to a sort of constraint. Now, what causes that constraint is extremely important. Critical, if one is thinking in terms of how do we move forward to overcome the barriers that exist, and all those red flags represent barriers of types. So how do we do it? Are we constrained because we're trapped in our own egg? You're trapped in your own egg, there is a developmental issue there, a courage issue, support issue from elsewhere, all those things, all, almost every heading that you can give within the human resource talent development uh, sort of programs that exist. So that is a personal issue, your own shell, and we need to understand it. The other one is, is the company holding you in a cage? Is the company constraining the brilliant ideas and initiatives that you have that could actually transform so much of what that company is trying to achieve as a business. So the problem there is it can be both your problem, it can be their problem. But whatever, it's a problem that has to be get, got over. I remember some years ago, I was asked to do a 10-minute keynote address prior to the launch of a book that was produced by a think tank and it was about security being resilience. Security being resilience. And I was asked, because it uh, was by, written by a lady who I've supported for many, many years, and I said, will you do a 10-minute introduction to this? Incidentally, that title has got problems with it, Security is Resilience, and that's not the exact title, but that's what it amounts to, because everything in life requires resilience, not just security. But when I talked about some of the ambitions that were potential with changing concepts, etc., within companies, somebody from the back over there stood up and said, uh, but how do we do this? He said, I can't do it. I said, why can't you do it? He said, because they won't let me. They won't let me. And I said, well, what's your strategy for dealing with they or them? Are you just saying they won't let me, so that's an end of the story? Because that is a reflection on the individual more than it is on them. The fact is there are always constraints to the progress, but there have to be found ways of getting around them. And there are ways. It's another strategy. And I can't go into that now. This whole topic, incidentally, could be subject of several theses. <laughs> and the ways of correcting these issues can be extended enormously in various sorts of training and awareness and coaching and mentoring, the sort of thing that we do all the time. Okay? But you can't be satisfied with just staying put, or if you stay put, you mustn't have ambitions that stem from the idea of what can come from your dreams at being at the table. Okay. When I go around companies, I always arrange to meet some of the people in the XCOM, C-suite, or the board, senior people who have either responsibility at that level for security, maybe the line manager of the chief security officer if he's just one removed, maybe others who have an interest because of some aspects like crisis management, cyber information security, which spreads more broadly across a range of functions, and I will ask them for their opinions on the chief security officer and on security. But primarily, I'm interested in the chief security officer and the security leadership team. That's one such heading. You know, never puts his head above the parapet. He plays it safe. Some of the other comments that come out. Here we go. Can you read those right at the back? Because I, I did comply with the requirement for font. Okay? Just look at some of those. 
Number three is particularly important in the context of what I'm talking about here. Not suitable for anything other than security. It's almost as though security is a black hole in which you drop people into it, doesn't it? It's, it's peripheral. That's how that's seen, okay? They make me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> wow. That might stem from their background <laughs> and the fact that they can't alter the characteristics that have been projected in a previous background, which I will come back to in a moment. This is from a CEO of a major multinational, one of the really big ones. Just read that. He was talking at an event that I ran some years ago in South Africa. And his point is, if he'd have talked about any other, what we might call, important function, so I'm granting now that security is important, any other important function, then he would have been able to point, in his experience, across several companies and his own company, people who had made it to these top positions. But he couldn't say that in respect of corporate security. Notice he gave the, didn't talk about security providers, security service suppliers, it's a different thing. That's a different thing. We're talking about that huge majority of corporations and organizations that lie outside of the security industry. So that was the situation that he found. Okay? Very telling. I talked about stereotypes, you know, and oh, they make me feel uncomfortable. In business, let me say again, not talking about the security industry, which is full of these people, but generally speaking, this is a threat to people. They don't feel comfortable. They don't look upon those as being business people. They do feel that they are living their old lives within the context of a new environment. What they're not doing is changing. Now to help people change, because it is a massive problem, um, I personally and, and my team help people around the world, do most of this for nothing, uh, to make transition from the public sector across all the dimensions that you could connect with this, across the public sector, into moving into the commercial environment. And we have two books out that cover that. But it's, for some of them, it's a nightmare. And most of them, if I'm honest, you may think this is unkind, because a number of you will come from these sort of backgrounds, but I, on the, on the average, and this isn't done because there's been a measurement by some government poll or anything, my goodness. We'll wait a moment. Right. I've almost forgotten where I was on that, as she, as she disturbed me. What was I saying then? Pun? Transition. I reckon 15%. If we're talking about moving into corporations at leadership level, 15% of people from these sort of backgrounds will be highly successful. And the others will probably not, and they will not be for a m myriad of reasons. But by and large, few are really, really highly successful. The battle to get a seat at the table is something which other functions have been challenged by. If we go back 30, 40 years, those functions that you see on the screen here were really, really challenged, picked up the baton of challenge to try and change the situation. Those that I show have largely attained a seat at the table. Now, you will be aware, some of you, of ones that have failed in your particular companies. You, some companies will be aware of where they achieved it, then lost it. 
And that was driven by people, personality. Okay? But they achieved it. They had the breakthrough. Most companies' head of HR does sit in the C-suite or the XCOM. That's a fact. Same as these. They made the progress. But why did they make the progress? First of all, they made it because they had the energy and the determination, and incidentally, were backed in a wonderful way by their professional associations and institutes. Wow. Think of the professional associations and institutes in the security world, not just here, overseas. I'm a member of many of them, incidentally, have been for, well, probably since about 1975, okay, those that existed. They haven't driven forward the case for security at the table. They haven't done it. They focus inwardly. It's almost that peripheral entity. That's like the, the guy who stays within his shell. The associations stay within their shells. They focus inwardly. They should be breaking the shell. They should be looking outside. They should be talking to other functions. They should be putting articles in the journals that CEOs and board people read. These people did that. They did it. And they made the breakthrough. Now, of course, they didn't have to overcome the stereotypical problem that I talked about a moment ago. That problem is less so now than it used to be because security is becoming more diverse. It's not diverse enough. In any multinational, the corporate security department Actually, I can think of one exception to this, but I'm still going to say any multinational, the corporate security department will be the least diverse department in terms of people of any department in the company. They will be the oldest, the fewest females, and they will suffer from the clonitis that you should have read on one of the earlier slides that everybody comes from similar background. That's Coming from certain backgrounds has some advantages, but when everybody coming from certain backgrounds, it's actually like an infestation. I shouldn't say that. Trump, Trump said that, didn't he, a couple of days ago. So, but it's a problem. It's a, it's a real problem. Okay? But they did it, and we've got to actually generate the capability of doing what they did. The benchmark, the lessons are there. How to do it is there. The courage is not. When I talk about courage, of course, it's about people. You know, I keep coming back to the fact it's people. It's people's characteristics. It's people's courage. It's people's imagination. It's people's intentions. It's people's determination. All of those things are absolutely critical to making the sort of move that I'm talking about. Get the right people, the right people in the companies, the right people in the associations and the institutes. <coughs> Get them, <coughs> and the chances are multiplied <coughs> dramatically if they're the right people. Get the wrong people and you will get a proliferation of a situation which is not helpful. <coughs> the questions. Do read those. Because those people, whether they're in institutes or whether they're in the companies, need to be asking themselves these questions and need to be coming up with answers which are compelling. Now I notice some people are taking camera shots of these. I think, I think if set somewhere along the line on their website will release all this. I don't put copyrights on anything that I do. I don't put copyrights because I want the message to get out, I want the changes to occur. Okay, so you use it, use it as you will. You know, what are my unique contributions? If your unique contributions are purely focused on security, big problem. Because all the other people in the C-suite, XCOM, whatever we care to call it, do not think just about what their original speciality was. That would be holding them back they would be seen as somewhat odd. In fact, they wouldn't even get in there. Okay, the specialist's dilemma. Time to read again. The bottom bullet point, particularly interesting, and I may have overstated 
the bottom bullet point slightly. But the truth is that if you have the right qualities, then you will be seen as somebody with the potential to take other positions. And it might be, for example, if you've got a seat at the table as the, the board director for security, it might be that someone says, HR aren't doing very well at the moment, so we'd like HR to be placed under you. Or we'd like something else to be placed under you. These examples that I'm giving you incidentally happen in real life. Because HR have been made them very successful, but there are in certain companies times when HR latest person reaching the C-suite didn't perform well, and so somebody else who wasn't from an HR background was put in charge of it. It's these sort of people who are not confined by their speciality that make those breakthroughs. Okay? Knowledge requirements. Time to read again. <laughs> Just read through it. You don't see that in any chief security officer's job specs. Okay? That's because the job spec isn't designed to embrace chief security officers being at the level that I'm talking about. But those who have any aspiration whatsoever, and when it's made in the future, they need to fit into that. And at the very bottom of that, when I talk about knowing the top team, it is a team. Whether it's called XCOM, C-suite, board, whatever it is, they're teams. The teams that work cohesively as a team is successful, and those that have break up because of personality problems don't. And that's, you, you, if you read Financial Times, the company section, most of the time companies are running very smoothly and they're running smoothly because they've got the right team. Occasionally you see someone's had to go. They've had to go because they're breaking up the focus and that, I'll call it camaraderie, which you'll see again in a moment, that is there within a team. It is a team and it's striving to be part of that team. Okay, I showed a shell before. Okay, that's what's got to happen. That's what's got to happen. You've got to get out of the shell, find ways of doing it, get a mentor or something who can help you, find a way, and the mentor may be in your own companies. One of the things I do when I do the reviews of companies and I find that there are certain things that they need to do to develop to be fully effective strategically in a corporate security context I look at board and, and uh, C-suite, XCOM level, I look to find a champion. Not necessarily the person that Chief Security Officer reports to. Somebody who, in the talking that I've done, understands that there is a challenge there with a potential reward that won't only benefit security, which will benefit the board if it's developed. And so look for a champion, and that champion, in a way, becomes the person who can be the mentor to all security initiatives which are there. Can't do it yourself, you need help. Okay, looking at the benefits, the benefits of having a seat on the top table, and I'll summarize these in a more general way with my last slide on benefits. But just look at them. The number three in particular, particularly put the ability to influence it's the ability to influence people, and in reality, the, you're influencing people who don't know much <laughs> about what it is you're doing and need convincing as to the value that you are going to deliver to it. But it's about that. It's about opening a door which enables influence to be delivered. Here we go again. When I talk about the power of networks, of course we all, you've all got networks, but I'm not talking about the networks you have now. I'm talking about that broader, multifunctional, cross-industry networking which is done above the level of single functions. Getting in there and doing that, that can be done before. The question of what you do with your life and your spare time. There are ways of getting engaged more broadly than within a tight security context. 
constructive conflict. I'm not talking about that sort of conflict that breaks up a board or a C-suite. I'm talking about that constructive disagreement with people who trust each other and therefore out of it comes something of a value instead of getting upset or hurt or anything like that. This is more generalized, the positive benefits of having that seat at the table. Notice I said in there, I've now said security feels recognized, heard and valued. This isn't about one person, chief security officer, regional security manager, country security manager. It's not about one person. It's about the efforts of getting those single people into the right positions benefits every aspect of security. Every person in security, whatever their primary role, is benefited by this. That's why it's so crucial. It's not just about personal ambition. It shouldn't... I'm a purist, incidentally. It shouldn't be driven primarily by personal ambition should be driven vocationally. Okay, and if you can't do that, use your ambition and make it look like vocation. Okay, but that's the thing. Very important. And you become a game changer, the whole activity, because you are able to start doing things that previously hadn't even come into mind because the possibilities were not there. Okay. That brings me to half an hour's halt. Where's my... Ah, there he is. Are we ready? Do you want me to take questions here? Okay, I'm now happy to take questions on anything that I've said, anything that I haven't said, because I'm not usually short of opinion on something. So it's over to you, and please do not speak until you get the microphone, and it would be helpful if you say who you represent. Thank you. Thank you ever so much for that talk, David. That was that ever so interesting. Uh, can I sort of be devil's advocate a bit? And I'd say that um, in recent years that security has become even more fragmented because now you've got business continuity, crisis management, you've got cyber security. So that, that makes it, I think that makes it more difficult for the CSO to keep a grasp of everything in security, let alone do the, th do the things that you've rightly mm. told us about. Yeah, you, uh, thank you for the question, because it does raise some very interesting issues. It starts with an issue of what is the definition of corporate security? That's the first point. And in different companies, corporate security will contain, in some cases, the totality that you described, in other cases, part of what you describe. Uh, and it will vary company to company. So my d description of corporate security usually, and this doesn't, the impact doesn't then go to a company that does something else, but my description is that corporate security is in effect all aspects of corporate intelligence and security, that corporate security is to companies what national security is to nations. If you take that and then what is security in nations, it isn't one department, it isn't MI5, MI6, the military, uh, it's also the treasury and everything else that leads to a secure condition. So you've got a couple of things coming out of this. One is if the chief security officer is a chief security officer who has the broadest spectrum of responsibility, his responsibility is also, and he's not often able to do it because the lack of the place at the table, the person if he's managed to prove the point, the person who on behalf of the board or the C-suite can actually be the overseer, might even be just conceptual overseeing if it's fragmented enough, the overseer of the totality of those elements and more that you talked about. Somebody who can actually look at the totality even if his particular department is only one part of it. If they don't have that, if they don't have that, there is a danger. And let me give you another example. I, I, in, have we got any Japanese people here? No? In Japan, most companies in Japan, multinationals, do not have security departments. 
They do not have chief security officers. They exist with the spectrum that you described, plus other elements, so it's quite possible that the strategic department will carry a responsibility that we would say fits in security. And all the other elements you describe, and so they all come down in single lines without a coordination. Some of those Japanese companies now, because Japan is beginning to be much more outward looking in the world, they even take part in United Nations peacekeeping now, much more outward looking, have started to adjust and try to reflect what occurs more often in what we would normally call Western multinationals. But the challenge that you talk about is there all the time. But if you talk, let's take another crisis management, right? That's, an, that's a function, isn't it? Crisis management is not a single, uh, it is not owned by one function. Crisis management can only exist if it is multifunctionally involved, but it still needs coordination. The coordination in most companies, big companies, will come from either the security department or the communications department. It's usually one of those two that leads in most companies. But the, but the other entities still have to play their part. If we look at uh, cyber information security, you know, if the IT department own cyber and information security in totality, and if I was going into a company, I'd say, whoa, there's a big problem here. Because not all cyber and information security relates to, te to high technology. So again, there's a need for coming together. So in a, com in a talk like this, this is a simplification in many ways if we're talking organizationally. Every single company has some different organizational challenges. But there is a terrific opportunity for what I call the chief security officer, if he plays or she plays her cards properly, can actually be the coordinator of the totality. The worst thing that could happen is that each of those individual elements arrive in the board, or the XCOM first, without coordination. Because that is silo thinking and silo operations, which I believe is personally hopeless. Okay, I've gone round in circles, but thank you for raising that. That was an important point. Anybody else? No? Nope.